Hey, Greg, this is Chris. I'm uh, just north of Pittsburgh, PA. I just found out about you maybe a month ago. I think I found you on Freeman TV. And uh, I think your show is really good. Just listen to Saturn Death Call. It was awesome. Uh, your shows are really fun. I just want to let you know I appreciate what you do. New listener, and I'm just going to keep listening, man. Be good, bro. In the 1930s, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt addressed the nation through a series of radio broadcasts known as the Fireside Chats. His aim was to reassure the common man that our society would recover from its troubled times. But we're far from 1930, and I deal with a different kind of fire. For a new era of worldly frustration, we offer a fresh conversation. I'm Greg Carlwood, and these are the Higher Side Chats. Here we go, Ironside Chatters. Welcome to THC. Drinking a little drink, smoking a ton of smoke, enjoying a sunny day in San Diego. I'm Greg Carlwood, and today is such an interesting show because typically we explore so many weird topics like UFO abductions, secret underground bases, classified military experiments, child pedophilia rings of the elite, all kinds of stuff. And a lot of these subjects imply that some people might go missing sometimes, either to be tested on or forced to work at these underground facilities, or kids taken and traded among the political, financial, and religious elite, or maybe some folks might get involved in an unsavory encounter with an Henri cryptid. There's a lot of weirdness out there, but usually when you get down to the details, there's not a ton of names or evidence of victims gone missing for these large-scale conspiracies or encounters. And today is almost a polar opposite show. We have a ton of victims of strange circumstance that have gone missing, and some have come back, but others don't. Yet we have almost no story or clues as to why they disappeared or what happened to them, because a lot of the clues we do have completely defy logic. And these could be victims of some of the earlier conspiracies or situations I mentioned, or we could be dealing with a completely new and different phenomenon altogether. One that you could say the National Park Service might even know about and is trying to keep a lid on. Now, when a lot of us think about the perfect getaway from the hectic 9 to 5, many envision a camping trip or hike among the fresh air and beautiful landscapes of sweet Mother Nature. But after hearing about the work of today's guest, that might all change. David Politis has spent 20 years in law enforcement out here in California, and he holds two degrees from the University of San Francisco and now has three volumes out of his amazing phone book thick series about missing people, Missing 411. It explores what he's come to find is a shockingly vast number of strange disappearances within national parks and other remote areas, mainly within the United States and Canada. But as the research continues, it seems pretty safe to say that these odd commonalities among the missing extend around the globe. I've had a hell of a time reading about these cases, and I don't think I've ever been more perplexed by a topic that included so much data and evidence that something strange is clearly going on, and I can't wait to get down to it. David, my man, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Greg. Appreciate being here. Yeah, thanks so much. I mean, you've created an amazing archive of missing people, and there seems to be a lot of curiosity and interest over the cases you've gathered because they're so strange, but uh, and, and the sheer numbers are pretty staggering, too. But I think there's kind of a tendency to see shows like Nancy Grace on TV or hear about these huge famous cases of a kid gone missing that we get every other year or so. And I think people are under the impression that the coverage of those cases, that that's an indication of the amount of people and children that really go missing. But that's pretty far from the truth, isn't it, man? I mean, you filled three books at this point. Correct. Actually, the, we just released the fourth book a few weeks ago. Wow. The topic is very, very complex without having a view of from 50,000 feet, it, it may look as though it's mundane, but when you get into the nitty gritty details of it, you start to realize that there really is something here. Yeah. And I know you've spent a ton of time in the great outdoors yourself and together with your law enforcement background, these things really put you in a prime position to be the guy who's doing this work because you recognize the strangeness and the patterns. And most importantly, the way that government agencies like the National Park Service are supposed to act. And they've been very kind of combative with you and withheld some information, sometimes unlawfully along the way, as you've tried to gather this data. It's been kind of strange, hasn't it? Well, I think it's a strange position for them to take, that's for sure. There's, there's no doubt about it. I, I, don't, I don't get it. What are some of the experiences you've had along the way trying to get some documentation for cases as you compile these books? Well, again, we're, 
we're nobody special than anybody else. We we run this organization under a website called the Can-Am Missing Project, and uh, we we just write Freedom of Information Act requests directly to the Park Service, just like everybody else. And according to the laws in the U.S., we have a right to government documents as long as they're not secret and they don't compromise the the welfare of the public. Mm -hmm. And one of the first things we requested was a list of missing people from the 183 locations that the Park Service manages. And to our astonishment, they came back saying that they don't keep track of information on missing people and they don't have any lists of missing people and apparently they don't keep track of missing people. <laughs> wow. A, a pretty astonishing statement coming from a group that has one of the largest federal law enforcement uh, contingents in the United States. Their law enforcement officers are all graduates of the Federal Law Enforcement Training Institute, one of the best training centers in the United States and in probably the world. So they definitely know the political correctness of needing this information. And as every law enforcement person that has contacted me says, they do not believe the Park Service. They believe they have the information and they're not giving it out. Seems like the one thing that they should be doing. Well, as, a, as another Park Service employee told me about a year ago, Dave, they know the number of uh, toilet paper rolls they have in the parks. <laughs> So to say that they don't keep track of everything at a minutia level, that's ridiculous. It's, it's a government agency. They know the importance of keeping this information. And to say they don't have it is ridiculous. Yeah. And I mean, again, you're just finishing the fourth volume of these books. And these are not just regular missing people cases. I mean, these are cases that have strange commonalities, which which we will get into some of them. But these are the cases where you filtered out a lot of the s standard reasons people might think that someone would go missing in a national park or out in the wilderness. Some of the things that seem a little more mundane. These are only the cases that have these these weird oddities, right? Correct. There, there's a profile that we came up with after reading a couple thousand cases. And that profile is the only one that we apply and the only one that we will do research about. So say somebody wants to voluntarily disappear somebody who has mental issues, drownings, things like that are excluded. Uh, animal attacks, they're excluded. Um, things like that that would be the vast bulk of the missing persons cases, we don't look into them. But after reading many, many, many cases, you start to see certain oddities fall out of the group. And Again, these aren't easily found, and a normal person would never find them, and a person working on a search and rescue team in, in a county would never understand this unless you looked at cases, and I'm talking thousands of cases from North, primarily North America, but there's a small percentage that, that are falling outside the U.S. as well. In fact, in the last year, we found a, a big association between cases in Australia and cases here in North America, and the oddities here have carried over there in the last century as well. But yeah, it, the normal cases that you hear about in the news, no, we don't work them. But if the if they do fit the profile, then we count them. It's so interesting that you're finding this to be a global phenomenon because that just adds another layer of mystery to it. Because you can't chalk it up to just you know one group of crazy people in Yosemite who live in the backwoods who kidnap kids. You know, you can't chalk it up to one thing in this area or one thing in another or even the whole country. I mean, it, it makes it makes you think that there's something going on, that's, there's something out there that we just don't even know or a force that deals with people in nature that we just don't have any information on. Well, and, and you did bring up Yosemite. So that's the largest cluster of missing people in the world that fall into the profile we've established. Now, there's 52 clusters of missing people in North America that we've identified. That Yosemite cluster is huge. It goes back about 120 years. And you're right, you, you, you couldn't say that it's a group of serial killers in North America that are at these different locations that have gone about killing people because it surpasses a generation. And therein lies one of the mysteries behind why this probably has never been 
understood or identified in the past, a lot of these disappearances, one may occur, uh, let's say, in Crater Lake National Park today, one more may occur in 14 years, and then one more may occur in 16 years. So three disappearances in one area would establish a cluster, but that's more than 30 years, and generally law enforcement people don't stay more than 25 or 30 years on the job. So when you look at it mm. in just your career, well, two incidences in 30 years you might not think much about, but when you have four or five or six in a 30-year period, it's going to raise the interest of everybody in that area and say, hmm, something strange is going on here. It's just enough not to raise the suspicion on a majority of occasions. Now, I bring up Crater Lake because there's been five or six boys under the age of 14 that have disappeared in or directly around Crater Lake under really, really suspicious circumstances. Definitely. Do you want to tell us about a couple of those cases? Well, I'll just briefly say that uh, one boy was with his dad and his grandpa, and they were looking for a Christmas tree right on the outskirts of of the park in an area where there was nobody. And they lost track of the boy for a short while. Just after the boy disappeared, it started snowing, snowing, and it continued snowing for days. Make a very long story short, a massive search effort went into this. The boy was never found. Now, uh, there is a weather phenomenon related, and it is part of this profiling that we do, that, and we can't explain why, but in a, in a majority of these circumstances, when somebody disappears, the weather changes for the worse. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's rain, sometimes it's fog, sometimes it's snow, but it deeply hampers the search effort. Now, also in Crater Lake, uh, there's a boy who had a disability, and he had a, a mental disability, and his name was Sammy Belke. He and his dad went up there on a vacation. Sammy ran up on a mound of dirt on a turnout where they stopped, and he turned and he walked off the mound. The dad ran up, or ran up to that mound, looked into the forest, didn't see the boy, huge search. The boy was never seen again. Now, therein lies another part of the profile on another higher percentage of these cases is kids or adults with disabilities. And we're, ta- we're not talking just mental. These can be physical. These can be some type of rare diseases that some people never have, but these, these people disappear and sometimes they're never found. Huh. And so people with disabilities is another area that we've started to track in the last three years that has gotten some real interesting results. Yeah, that is a weird one. I mean, I'd say probably the cases that interest me the most, the commonalities that seem most mysterious to me would be the ones where young children go missing and are found much further away than a child should be able to travel in the woods alone. And this happens time and time again, doesn't it? So I'm glad you brought that up because I've given many talks in front of large groups And I always ask the audience, I say, how many people in the room have kids? And usually it's about two thirds. They raise their hand. And I, and I ask them, well, when you had a two year old boy or girl, if we put them in the middle of the forest and we told them to walk out and they didn't know the direction to walk out, how far would they go before they sat down and gave up or sat down and took a nap? And usually the answers range anywhere from a hundred yards to maybe a mile. (laughs) <laughs> right, And then I ask them, well, would they walk uphill or downhill? And it, usually it's 99% say downhill. And so I, I like to ask you, Greg, since you read a lot of the stories, what is a reasonable distance that a two-year-old would walk, in your opinion, after reading? Man, I mean, I would say at max two miles. I mean, anything beyond that would seem super crazy. I mean, we're two years old. Think of how young that is. I would be surprised if they even got a mile. I mean, the woods are pretty treacherous. Like, it's kind of tough to climb over logs and, and over mountains and sometimes across uh, big ri- raging rivers. You know, it, it doesn't seem like they could get very far. And, and that's that's part of the point that the parents bring up in these discussions. They said, well... You know, a lot of kids don't start walking till 12 to 16, 17 months. Now you drop yeah. them in the woods with obstacles, creeks, like you said, logs. How far would they go, <laughs> especially without an adult there prodding them? Right. That's that's the scariest thing. That's why I like this uh, little section of, of stories, because 
it seems like there's some type of assistance, you know, it seems like there's some kind of intelligent, some kind of being that's able to pick up these kids and take them to areas that are miles away that they couldn't do on their own. So that's what's so eerie about it. But uh, I guess to get into a couple of these cases, um, let's talk about this case of uh, Tommy Jenkins. This kid uh, was two to three years old from in Fort Lewis, Washington, found two days later. Uh, what's his story? So that's an interesting one. For the people who don't know, Fort Lewis is in the central area of Washington. It's 33,000 acres. And in 1950, it was, a, it was a big spot where the U.S. had approximately 6,000 soldiers on site and housed. And there's a, in the middle of it, there's an area called the American Lake, and it's a big lake kind of sitting in the center of the, of the fort. It, it kind of bisects Highway 5 in that area, and it, it's, a, it's a fairly pristine spot. Well, on May 4th, 1950, Tommy lived in a non-commissioned area of housing with his mom and dad, and they lived about 1,500 feet from the lake. Well, during that time span on that day, his mom kind of lost sight of him, and she knew that Tommy was playing with an Irish setter dog named Lassie that belonged to the next door neighbor. Now, I'll stop people there. Here's another part of this profiling is that a large, large percentage of people and kids disappear with a canine. Mm -hmm. And I can't explain it other than it's fact. And we'll talk about that more later. But Tommy disappeared with this canine. He didn't arrive back for lunch. And if you have kids, you know, your kids aren't late for lunch. (laughs) They're hungry kids. They come back and they eat. Well, when he doesn't come back, the mom gets scared, calls the husband, calls officials. The base commander did the right thing. He shut down the base, and within hours, he had over 1,000 soldiers searching for the boy. Within 36 hours, he stopped everything on the base, and he had all 6,000 of the soldiers searching. Wow. He had helicopters from the base in the air, and he had planes flying formation around the base. Three different bloodhound teams were used looking for Tommy during this time period. So the third day rolls around, and a soldier is going through some bush, and he finds Tommy and this dog named Lassie on the beach in perfect condition. And they bring him back in, and the base commander gives an interview. And in the interview, he says, there is no boy this age that could have survived the rain and the wind and the outdoor conditions we've had in the last three days. There's no way, unless he had some assistance. And that kind of shook up the base. And the dad kind of took the lead on that and tried to question Tommy, and he couldn't get a coherent answer out of him. And he couldn't determine if he was trying to be evasive or his mind was blank, or something. But the final outcome was Tommy was in really, really good condition for a boy being out supposedly in the wild for three days. And then the other part of that is how in the heck did 6,000 soldiers, three helicopters, multiple planes, miss a boy and a dog? Right. Yeah, that is such an interesting case. I mean, apparently it got to 40-degree weather, and you, like you said, raining, like, and the, the, the kid was, it seemed like he was taken inside for two and a half, three days and then brought back out. Like he just walked right out into the yard to play with this dog. But I guess the only real thing that he said that was uh, kind of interesting is he slept in an area with no homes and that he uh, fell into a creek. He said he fell into a creek, but he showed up dry. Just so weird. And again, uh, this one case, If you read it on its own, you could roll it through your mind and say, you know what, maybe he found some shelter, maybe some people housed him, maybe there there was a crime that occurred here where some pervert or something took him. But that's one case of, you know, hundreds and hundreds, approaching 2,000 now that we've identified, that doesn't make any sense. 
And another thing we should point out about the numbers that you're gathering is a lot of this in terms of documentation, there are issues with classification. If someone is presumed dead because of the elements or if they've been missing long enough, they're no longer in missing people files. That's kind of an issue for you as, when you go back into some of these, isn't it? Well, and that is a big, big issue, and that's part of the National Parks Department of Interior and U.S. Department of Agriculture that manages a lot of this land. That's part of a classification they came up with to eliminate these people from public record, meaning, say, somebody disappears in a national forest, and it's snowing, blah, blah, blah. They go 16 months without finding them then they get a classification called missing presumed dead, meaning they're deceased, meaning they're no longer missing, meaning that you're not going to find them on any databases. As an example, the National Institute of Justice has a program that they instituted about four years ago where they are trying to get DNA on every missing person case in the United States <laughs> because... There's coroner's offices throughout the U.S. in these rural areas, many in Oregon and Washington and in California, where they have bones that they can't identify. There's no, there was no national database where they could go to them and say, hey, uh, did someone disappear in a 100-mile radius of here? Now they can go to this National Institute of Justice site, and they can query it, and they can get this information. Now, in the last 14 months, We've supplied them at their request with 12 cases that they had never heard of before of missing people hmm. that we had gotten the documentation and the reports on. Uh, many of them come, came out of Oregon and Washington where they have this classification or the sheriff's office or the police department lost the reports and just threw away the case by accident. We we got the documentation back. We went back to them. They re revived the report. They, dis they confirmed that the person's still missing. The Department of Justice now has this information, or the National Institute of Justice now has this information. So I like to say that our work has done some good in this long-term process of trying to identify people. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely noteworthy. Um, yeah, and and in, on the subject of Oregon, let's talk about these two cases that are kind of connected when, when we're talking about kids that are traveling distances they shouldn't be able to. These cases are 30 years apart, but only 19 miles by distance. And that would be Cody Sheehy, I think, and uh, Keith Parkins? Cody Sheehy and, and Keith Parkins, yeah, both of them strange, strange cases. But uh, in April of 1986, Cody Sheehy's 20, or correct that, six years old. He was in an area near Willowa, Oregon, it's about 26 miles from the Washington border in the Blue Mountains in the far eastern sector of the state. He went on a picnic with his family, and he and his sister were playing this game called Explorers, where they kind of split up and they hide and they stay hidden for a little while. And Anyhow, as it was happening, at about 12.30 that afternoon, the mom couldn't find Cody. Well, the mom, the dad, and the sister searched till 2.30, and they then called law enforcement. And within a couple of hours, this is quick for this part of the country, they had two helicopters in the air with FLIR, forward-looking infrared radar, and a dozen searchers were on site within an hour. That first night, searchers got up to almost 75. They're walking on the ground. They're yelling for their boy. They're calling his name, blah, blah, blah. They're not getting any responses. The helicopters with the flare in the air aren't seeing anything on the ground. At 7.30 a.m. the following morning, Cody arrives at a house on the outskirts of this nearest town. And this house was 18 miles from where he was camping with his family on this picnic. And he walked up and he asked for some help. And the people wisely grabbed him and said, hey, you know, we'll get the help for you. Law enforcement was called, and he's identified. Well, he, he made some real fascinating statements. He told uh, his parents and law enforcement that he hid from a helicopter that night. And mm -hmm. the interesting part was the heli there were no helicopters up at night, and they don't fly at night because of safety reasons. <laughs> 
And he also said he hid from coyotes at night. And that puzzled the people because they, they were out at night on foot and they didn't hear or see any coyotes. He was found to be in excellent condition. And it goes back to that statement you said earlier, Greg, where this boy at six years old went 18 miles in <laughs> about 14 hours. Right. 16 hours. Unbelievable. It, it's it's too weird. And and then Keith Parkins was actually way, 30 years earlier than that, but just 19 miles away, something very similar, right? Correct. He was uh, visiting his grandparents' ranch, and he was walking around the ranch. He was only two years old, and he disappeared. There's a giant search, and people are coming out of the woodwork to help. And this location is 90 miles southwest of Willowa. In the, gen- in the general general area, so to speak, and uh, this was in April of 1952. And the, the following morning, 19 hours later, after he disappears, two mountain ranges, several barbed wire fences, several creeks, two search and rescue people, and his dad are in a dry creek bed 12 miles away. And they find the boy face down in this dry creek bed, alive, but barely. Huh. Now, they said his, his pants were torn to shreds, and uh, he was suffering hypothermia, etc. Now, when we read this, and there were three of us that read this, we said, wow, that's, that's a phenomenal story. But almost simultaneously, the cops in us come out, and they say, well, wait a minute. This two-year-old boy has gone for 19 hours. There isn't a search and rescue person in the world that would tell a dad and other workers to go look in a creek 12 miles away. That's ridiculous. Right. So our question to ourselves, and we threw this around a lot, is why were they there? What did they know, or why did they suspect that would be a reasonable place to even search? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd have the same question. It's it's very odd. And um, not only are there a lot of cases where these kids are found many, many miles away, but also sometimes in mountainous areas, they're found miles up, which seems even tougher for a kid under 10 years old. Uh, one of my favorites, that I thought it's hard to say favorites, but the one of the ones I thought was most intriguing was uh, Kenneth Edwards five years old, in uh, Rosemont, California. You remember that one? Oh, yeah. No, you, you know, the, the issue is, is that with these cases, as you know, because you've, you've looked at them, is there's, there are a series of disappearances that all kind of look the same after a while, and that's, that's the baffling part. I mean, these kids that disappear, in your mind, you don't think, well, there's, they're not really going to be found, you know, five miles away and uphill. Right. And so search and rescue may not throw a lot of resources at it. But in Kenneth's uh, case, again, two years old, April 4th, 1964, about 2 p.m., he's in an area near Rosamond, California, five miles north of L.A., right near the Los Angeles National Forest. His family took a trip, and they got into this area, and somehow or another, Kenneth got away from him. Well, the parents called the CHP, California Highway Patrol, National Guard, Kern County Sheriffs. Multiple, multiple bloodhound teams come into the area. And initially, they started to question the parents because the dogs aren't finding any scent. And this is another part of the profiling is that the dogs on these cases, 99.9% of the time, can't find a scent. So the sheriff's office moved their perimeter, meaning the area they're searching from two to five miles out. And they're yelling for the boy. They're not hearing anything. They're not hearing a boy. They're not getting anything. So a Native American tracker came in. He didn't find any tracks of the boy. And then about two miles from the original camp, they find his jacket and his sweatshirt, which they thought was strange because it was really pretty cold outside. Mm Mm-hmm. And then uh, later on, they find him lying on a ridgetop on a cliff seven miles from where 
He originally disappeared, and a thousand yards from the sheriff's command post, which they had moved. Now he's found face down, which is unusually an unusual way to find somebody, but a common way that people that we've identified are found. Mm-hmm. Now the original story was is that he was chasing a rabbit and got away from his parents. Well, there's multiple issues about this that don't make sense. First of all, how could the boy outrun his parents if he was chasing a rabbit? <laughs> yeah. How could he get seven miles away at two years old, and how could he find and get on top of a cliff? Right. Yeah, the climbing is just, it's one of those elements that it adds even another layer of mystery. It's just like, it seems like they're being assisted by something, or we're just not giving enough credit to these two-year-olds. You know, <laughs> I think that if you if you have kids, I think a parent is probably the best judge about the strength and the ability of their child, and... I haven't heard too many say that that could happen. Yeah. And there was uh, another kid, Larry Lewis, who was pretty young, also in California. And my note here that I took says he was found several miles up from where he disappeared. You remember that one? That's a weird, That that's even a more unusual case in that he was at uh, kind of the, the foothills of the Sierra, the south fork of the Mokalumni River in Calaveras County. June 9, 1945 years old, about 10 a.m. His family went up there for a trout fishing trip. His dad took a couple of the sons up the river, and as they were coming back down, Larry disappeared. Now, it's a pretty good-sized river, and so I think initially the thought was maybe he went into the river. But the U.S. Forest Service and Calaveras County Sheriff's Office did a pretty good job in, in rounding up 100 searchers to comb the area. And they worked it hard. And at 4 p.m. the following day, they found that Larry had traveled through his 24 hours. He had climbed in excess up and down 11,000 feet and three miles. God. And he was found sleeping in a thicket. Now, I'll stop the people here. And, I'll, and I know you know this, Greg, but in these books... In each story, there's at least one or multiple um, notes about where this information came from and the articles and the author, etc. So if there's ever any question about the veracity of what I'm saying in here, you can always go back and check and you can see that this is exactly what was said. Many times we get the search and rescue reports or directly straight law enforcement reports, and I know it's it's phenomenal to hear these things and you think, oh, you know, this, this is just an isolated case, but that's what makes the books interesting is that these aren't isolated cases. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, um, another commonality we mentioned with, with Kenneth Edwards is he took off some of his clothes. He took off his coat and that seems to happen a lot, which is, is, is a really weird thing. And that would link us to the Corey Kelly case, uh, not a kid, 38 years old, but definitely had an issue with the clothing, right? Now, Corey Kelly's case, that that's pretty weird, to say mm-hmm. the least. But I've actually been into that area of Minnesota, and, I, I mean, I can't... You won't believe the facts of it when you hear it, and after you go to the area, you're going to say, because this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it's the Red Lake Wilderness in far northern Minnesota, October 16, 2006, Corey was 38 years old. He had been to this area many, many times. He knew it well. Him and one of his best friends named Jim Neprud and Jim's Labrador dog went to the area to go hunting. And as the men were setting up camp, Jim realized that they needed some uh, some gas for their stoves. And so he Corey said that he was going to wait with the dog while Jim went into town and Corey was going to take the dog and they were going to to do some grouse hunting. So Jim left. Jim comes back in an hour and a half and Corey's gone. And it's about 7 o'clock at night. So Jim sets up the car, honks the horn, flicks the lights. He's not getting any response for Corey or the dog. And he calls, he finds some people that are in another adjoining camp that were leaving, tells them to call for law enforcement. 
they bring in massive amount of troops from the Beltrami County Sheriff's and state troopers, and there's a massive search for two weeks. Now, if you if you stop for a second and think that how far can Corey Kelly get in an hour and a half? Mm -hmm. And how far would he really want to go in an hour and a half knowing his buddy's going to be back and they're going to make dinner? So all the indications are that this was going to be just a short, you know, maybe go out a couple hundred yards with the dog and look around. And if you see a grouse, great. If not, come on back and let's make dinner. But that's not, not what happened. And the dog didn't respond to all the bar, all the yells and things that Nefrid was giving for his dog, which was strange. So on October 25th, nine days after uh, Corey disappears, some searchers were nine miles away, and they find the lab wandering in the woods. And it's dehydrated and hungry. Now, one thing about being dehydrated that didn't make any sense to the searchers and doesn't make any sense to me is that there is more water in this area of the Red Lake Wilderness than you can imagine. <laughs> it's a very swampy, boggy area where there's no way a dog should ever be dehydrated. And hungry, I, I suppose that could be true if it hadn't had anything to eat. <laughs> but they took the dog to a vet and they took a sample from its stomach and found that it had been eating deer. And that puzzled them. So they keep searching, and a, a day later, they find Corey's cigarettes and a lighter. A, a key point here. Corey was a, a known hunter. He carried adam, uh, an adequate supply of, of clothes and things to keep warm, it wasn't that cold, and he had a lighter that if he wanted to start a fire, he could start it. But the cigarettes and the lighter were on the ground, and that, that caused a lot of concern. The following day, 14 miles from the campsite, uh, a tracker found his overalls, his socks, and his hooded sweatshirt. Hmm. Now, when you read the cases in this books, in these books, something starts to come out at you, and that is is that in many of these instances, people are missing shoes or clothing or both. Yeah. And I know a lot of people say, well, hypothermia sets in and you start stripping clothes. But there was no reason for hypothermia to set in because Corey had the ability to start fire, and he was dressed real warm, and he had the dog with him to keep him warm. Right. And even if you, even if you did have to take off your clothes for some reason, wouldn't you go keep track of them? You know, I would think. <laughs> and, and many of the stories that I write about, these people's clothes are found in close proximity to where they disappeared, even before hypothermia could ever have set in. Many of the small kids who find that they stripped their clothes, the parents say they didn't even know how to take their clothes off. Right. Yeah. At that young age, it's even, even weirder. I mean, you've been looking at this for a lot longer than I have, of course, and I can't think of any, but have you ever gotten a rational response as to why people would be missing their clothing outside of, I guess, hypothermia? Well, it's, it's called paradoxical undressing and it's paradoxical because they can't figure it out. <laughs> right. And so I think there's there's a little more to this than everyone kind of understands in that it's a, it's a, a convenient answer to a very complex scenario. And as you'll see, so uh, about October 30th, about 14 days after the search started, snow is falling, they hamper the search. Search, and again, dogs, canines coming into the field, they can't pick up a scent. And so this goes off and on for another two weeks. And finally, the efforts to find Corey are terminated on November 23rd. On April 28th, snow starts to melt, things start to come open again, and the sheriff gets in a helicopter and they start flying the area around where they found his clothes. And in some real high reeds, about 15 feet off a, a nearby trail, they found, find Corey laying nearly naked in the reeds. Huh. 
So does it make sense to anybody what happened to Corey Kelly? No. And uh, the sheriff made a statement that he thought that Corey must have died that first night. And he has no reason why he made that statement. He has no justification. And Corey's mother was interviewed and she said, I don't believe my son even could have made it 14 miles through the woods to where he was found in that first night. Mm -hmm. And better, better question is why would he? (laughs) Right. It, It doesn't make logical sense. And I just think taking off shoes, I mean, that is just the worst idea if you're outside. You, you, your feet are very sensitive. You can't travel without shoes. It just seems like of all the things you'd want to keep if you weren't well equipped to be out there is your shoes. So as I've, I've told this before, and our, our group has talked about this at length, what's the one thing about shoes that may be different about everything else we wear on our body. And I always ask people to think about this. And the one thing we've come up with, and we're not saying this is a reason or it's not, but the one thing about shoes that's different than everything else we wear is it's probably the one place on our body that has the most bacteria. Hmm. And I don't know what it means, but that (laughs) is the one thing that's different. Yeah, that's interesting, because I've also thought about that, because I know for a while I was listening to your interviews, and you would bring up these feet that were washing up in Nova Scotia. I think something like over a dozen or a couple dozen feet in shoes have washed up on the coast, and I would think the same thing. What's different about shoes, and why are there feet in shoes and no bodies? And my thought process then was that the creatures of the sea maybe are eating the bodies, but the the shoes are too tough because of the rubber. The shoes are a little harder to get through. I don't know, but um, yeah, it doesn't make sense in either case. No, and the the weird part about those uh, British Columbia, there's, I think, eight or ten cases now in British Columbia, and I only know of one case where they've been able to identify who, whose foot it was. So I think that's, a perplexing scenario that they can't, even though they have good DNA, they can't seem to identify these people. It makes you wonder where they came from or what happened. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's such a weird thing. And another case uh, that was super interesting of a, of a kid had gone missing, you know, we've talked about several of these people are so far from where they're supposed to be. You think that it'd be something assisted, but you never get any kind of indication that that might be the case. But there is one story where there is a, a slight inclination that there might have been uh, something intelligent involved moving something, uh, and that would be Dennis Martin's case. Now, Dennis's case is, is the longest case I've ever written about in any book, and it's, it's something that, I mean, I, one of the only cases I've ever proactively sought out the parents and probably the hardest case I've ever sat down to write because it, it hurt me to write it. Mm. But uh, June 14th, 1964, Great Smoky Mountain National Park. Dennis was six, year old, six years old. He was with his dad and his grandpa and his brother. And they were spending a Father's Day outing at a location called Spence Field. Spence Field sits up about 1,500 feet from the, the lower elevations of the park. It's a very serene area. you got to walk into it. You can't drive to it. The family uh, hiked in, the, the four men, and they set up in this kind of grassy area, and the, the two boys were playing as Grandpa and Dad were sitting there watching them. And there's a lot of really, really strange things that happen with this case that nobody could ever explain and the odds would be phenomenal. But as they're in the middle of this wilderness setting on the east, in this meadow, another family comes up to the Martins and asks them if their boys and their family could play with the Martin boys. Mr. Martin stood up, shook their hand and goes, Hey, my name is so-and-so Martin. And this family turned around and said, Oh, wow. Our, our last name's the Martins as well. Huh? Now, what would be those odds? You know, you, you think about that. That's pretty strange. And uh, through the Spencefield area runs the Appalachian Trail. 
And during the years, I've written a lot about the Appalachian Trail and, and the unusual things that have happened along it. And there's many strange things. But through Great Smoky Mountain National Park in this area, the trail runs. So the families sit down and they start, the boys start playing a game of hide and seek. And Mr. Martin tells me that he's sitting in the chair and he watches Dennis go up to this bush right on the edge of the wilderness at the end of this meadow. And Dennis hides behind the bush and he goes, I'm looking at it. I'm about 50, 60 feet away. And uh, he says, everybody comes out from playing hide and seek and Dennis doesn't come out. So he says, I call the name and then I start walking over to the bush and I get behind the bush and Dennis isn't there. And he goes, something in my gut told me something really bad happened. And the Appalachian Trail is right next to where Dennis was. And Mr. Martin took off. He was in excellent shape. He took off running for two miles down the Appalachian Trail as everyone else is looking for the boy. And he comes back and he's, nobody can find him. So the grandpa takes a quick stroll down the mountain to get help as everyone continues to look for Dennis. Now, simultaneously as this is going on, a family from outside the area drives into Great Smoky Mountain National Park and goes up to a ranger and asks them where they can go, where they can see bears. And the ranger says, hey, you go to this area right, right outside of Cades Cove called Rowan's Creek, and there's a lot of wildlife there. You should be able to see something. Family says, okay. So the family parks their car, and they start walking up this valley. I've been in the valley pretty thick, pretty rugged, beautiful. And the, this is another unusual coincidence. The last name of this family is the Key family, K-E-Y. And astonishingly, in the opinion of many, this is the key point of this case. As the family is walking up Rowan's Creek, uh, their 12-year-old son says, wow, dad, Look at that. And he points up a hill that's in front of him. He says, I think I see a bear. At about this time, this family hears this scream described as earth shattering, the loudest scream they've ever heard in their life. And they look up the hill and they see this thing hiding behind trees, apparently trying to avoid detection by the family. Mm -hmm. And the dad says, well, son, I don't think that's a bear. I think that's a man. And this thing continues to dodge the trees, but the people get a pretty good look at it. And eventually they lose sight of it, and they go back to their car. Now, at 8.30 that night, this, the disappearance of Dennis happened at 4.30. At 8.30 that night, the rain starts to fall, and it falls hard at a rate that by midnight there was two and a half inches of rain in the park and it continued to rain like that for the next seven days. Now there was a huge response from the U.S. Air Force, National Park Service, local jurisdictions, etc. Now Dwight McCarter uh, eventually was the head tracker for the National Park Service in Great Smoky Mountain National Park and he wrote a book about tracking and he's been interviewed a couple of times about this case and we actually went out and interviewed him he's retired now and he he has a great memory he goes I'll never forget this he said uh, I was one of the liaisons between mr. Martin and the National Park Service hmm. so I'll get back to Dwight but as the search is going on helicopters are flying in and out and two big helicopters come into the park filled with the Green Beret Special Forces. Now, there's rumors out there that, oh, they were training nearby and just happened to stop by. The reality of it is, I have a file probably four inches thick from the National Park Service on this, and nobody that I could ever determine called them. Nobody asked them to come into the search. Nobody gave them permission to land in the park, but they showed up. And McCarter told me that when they came in, they set up their own camp away from everyone else with their own communication systems. And when the National Park Service says, well, why don't we put three of your guys with one of our guys since we know the area and we could be more efficient searching, they said, no, we'll search by ourselves. 
very, very strange, according to McCarter, that anybody, no other group had ever done that before. So at the maximum point, there were almost 1,400 searchers inside the park looking for Dennis. And the FBI sent an agent to quote-unquote monitor the case, but they didn't suspect that a crime had occurred, but he was going to monitor the case. So the day after Dennis disappears, on the front of the Knoxville Times is a picture of Dennis Martin about this disappearance. The key family reads it and says, wow, you know, the times are kind of close. I wonder if what we saw on the mountain had something to do with Dennis's disappearance since it was almost directly below where he disappeared. Right. So the FBI sends an agent and a ranger to contact the Key family, and the Key family says, hey, we'll meet you at the park, and we'll show you the point where we saw this, and you can kind of see the distances and things. FBI says, no, we'll meet you at your house or somewhere in between, but don't come to the park, which is wrong, because as an investigator, you want to see the distances and see if they could see what they claim to see. And, and so it seemed odd. And Mr. Martin had an agreement with the FBI and the Park Service that any leads that they had on this case, that they would immediately come to him and tell him. He never left the park. He stayed in the park for six weeks, nonstop, helping, looking, kind of being the eyes and ears. He's an architect. He's a very smart man. And I think he did the right thing by staying there and monitoring the situation. But make a long story short, that key family observation wasn't told to him by the FBI or the Park Service. Uh, a reporter happened to hear about it from another source, went out and interviewed the key family, came back and told Mr. Martin that, hey, the FBI has already interviewed this family, and you ought to get on this. This, this sounds like an interesting lead. So Mr. Martin confronts him, and he gets told a series of lies. He gets told that the time frames couldn't work. He gets told that they, it wasn't a substantiated sighting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he gets mad. So he gets a hold of McCarter and he says, hey, Dwight, he says, this, they're saying that the times don't match up, blah, blah, blah. And McCarter says, well, I think they do. He says, let's you and me just move at a quick pace, but let's see if we could do it. Mm -hmm. The following day they do it, and they do it within the time frame that the key family saw what they saw. This makes Mr. Martin even more mad that they're outright lying to him now. So he gets a hold and he actually gets an opportunity to talk to the key family and he, it, the irritation gets worse. Make a long story short, the park service doesn't tell him the truth. Uh, they're evasive with their answers. He, he gets the feeling that he's never told the truth from the beginning he told me he had the feeling that somebody was pulling strings, strings up the upper end of the National Park Service and that the superintendent was merely a mouthpiece. That was his words. Man. So if this was your son, can you imagine how irate you'd be at this point? Right, of course. So after two months, everything starts to wind down. They really there, There's rumors that there was a shoe print found somewhere. They didn't really find anything worth a darn. And from what I read on this, and after interviewing McCarter, McCarter's beliefs were that Dennis was abducted. Even though there's nothing anywhere that says that this was a possibility, he was there at the time, he knew the distances, he knew the facts, and that was his opinion. So I said, well, Mr. Martin hasn't talked to the press since the day this happened supposedly because even the press lied to him. So myself and another investigator, without a phone call or anything, just went up and knocked at his door. And he came to the door, recognized him, and I explained who I was. I said, I, I've devoted months to the case. I probably know more about it than anyone other than your family. And I'd like to talk to you. And he says, you know, he says, the disappearance has ruined my life and my wife's life. It's, it's been a, a compelling issue for all of us. We can't get over the fact we lost our son, and we decided years back to just put it to rest and not talk about it. Hmm. I said, hey, I, I came here from California. Can you give me just 15 minutes of your time? Because I have some really important questions to ask. 
He opened the door, came outside on the front porch. He says, Dave, you got it. What do you want? So he confirmed everything that I just said. But in addition, whenever I'm interviewing a witness on a case like this, I always ask him a series of questions at the end that I need clarity about and things maybe that I didn't understand. And one of the things I ask is that, what do I need to know about this that wasn't in the press, that that wasn't talked about in the media, but has been a compelling issue to you? Mm-hmm. And Mr. Martin says, well, Dave, he goes, you know, that thing that they saw on the Hill. I said, yeah. And he says, there was never anything in the paper, never anything in the media, but that key family told everyone that whatever they saw had something on its shoulder. Mm. And he says, they wouldn't put that in the paper. They wouldn't talk about it in public, but they would tell me. Man, that that, that is such a, a fascinating case with so many details. It is super sad. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, wasn't there, isn't there another detail about an, an FBI agent that was investigating a lot of disappearing people in that area? Yeah, there was. And uh, when we, when I started to look into this case, there were several others in the general region that disappeared. But in addition to Dennis, there were also two other people that disappeared inside that park after him under suspicious circumstances. And in all of these cases in the park and around the park, there was the same FBI agent that was sent by the Bureau to quote unquote monitor the case. Now when an agent is sent to monitor a case, every day he writes a series of notes that gets sent to Virginia to the profiling center where other agents look at it and they try to find matching cases in other areas that are similar. And similar to what I'm doing on these cases. And this agent did this in all of the cases. And after a while, this, whatever agent is writing it will get responses from headquarters about, you know, this matches this, this matches that, blah, blah, blah. Well, in my conversations with Mr. Martin, I said, okay, so yeah, the key family saw this. That, and I said, wow, that's, that's pretty impressive. He says, yeah. He says, Dave, I know you also wrote about these other cases in the area. And he said, you specifically mentioned this FBI agent. I said, yeah. He says, do you know that that FBI agent committed suicide? I I probably had a during the headlights look at looking at him. (laughs) He said, no, that's true. And after we left, we did confirm that that agent did commit suicide. Wow. It's like this case of all cases is the one that makes me think that they know more about what's happening and they're covering something up. And the answer that I've heard you give in the past for why this might be is just they don't want to lose park revenue because it is such a huge thing for their states. And everyone wants just the nice cuddly image of Smokey the Bear. They don't want to think about anything else dangerous out there. Well, one of the things in the latest book that I wrote about is I got pretty lucky. I was in a national park, maybe it's a year and a half, two years ago now, with another investigator. And uh, we were listening to a group of rangers talk in a small shed at this national park. I just stood in the doorway and listened, and there were a couple of guys in plain clothes that were also chiming in, older guys. And I could tell this one guy really knew a lot. And He was either a retired ranger or something, but I followed him out into the parking lot and introduced myself, and we ended up having this lengthy, lengthy conversation. And he was a retired special agent from the National Park Service. And what that is, is law enforcement rangers do that first contact on a victim or a suspect in the field, and the special agents inside the Park Service are the follow-up entity. They're like the detectives that do the the long-term investigative work. And this guy was a retired special agent for the Park Service. And I, I explained to him the type of work we'd been doing and the results we had and the responses. And he looked me in the eye after I said, why would the National Park Service take this position? And I quote him directly, he said, Dave, it's a complete lack of integrity. Hmm. And when a family is at its lowest possible point 
and they look to law enforcement and they look to the government for support and they get lies and evasiveness. Can you imagine what that would do to your, as a person at that lowest point in your life? Right. I mean, we deal with a lot of issues on this show that involve distrusting government agencies, but man, to, to think that you would have trusted the, you know, the government the whole time. And then when you really need them, you really need them. You never thought you would. And there's just, you face these kind of roadblocks just to get information about your own relatives. It's, it's very sad. It, I, it's completely debilitating. I mean, I, I, I talked to Mr. Martin about it and I don't know how he didn't go completely crazy on the park service for what they did to him. Right. And he told me, he said, Dave, this is the reason why I don't trust the press and I don't trust the government. He said, they lied to me. They were evasive. He said, the only guy that was even slight, he goes, was honest to me was Dwight McCarter. He said, he tried to help me understand, but even he couldn't understand why they didn't think at the beginning that this wasn't an abduction and handle it appropriately. Mm -hmm. And on the subject of that thing that the Key family saw, I mean, any speculation on what that was? I mean, did it seem like a person? Or, I mean, she described it as a bear. Of course, everyone knows that the most famous cryptid is Sasquatch. I mean, it's, it just seems very weird, but that's the only thing that it kind of seems to allude to. So, McCarter, I asked him about that, and he said, well, he goes, a few years before Dennis disappeared, there was a this was a time when the rangers were not armed in national parks. And he said a ranger was working alone in a back area of Great Smoky Mountain National Park, and he was attacked by what McCarter described as a wild man, meaning a guy living off the grid like you and me that lived off animals that wore furs and didn't, didn't have any ethics. And he said that uh, this this wild person attacked the ranger and almost killed him. And he said, you know, he goes, the only thing I could think of is that this family saw one of these wild men that lives in the parks <laughs> that the park service doesn't want to acknowledge lives there and maybe took Dennis. But he says, it'd be conjecture at this point. But he goes, I don't know what else to think of it. Yeah. That's so interesting and weird. And, uh, on another radio show, I heard you talking about this case, and you had alluded to, or you just you just kind of mentioned in passing that there was a remote viewer report that was fairly interesting, and I was pretty intrigued by that. Do you have any details on, on what that remote viewer saw? Actually, it wasn't a remote viewer. It was a psychic. Gotcha. He had written in to the Park Service and uh, supplied a report that was in this massive amount of documents, and... This guy had some apparent notoriety for the time and said that his mind had a difficult time going to where it was going because it was such a dark place. Wow. And he, he thought it was a, there was a creek nearby that possibly was a cave, but that what was happening to Dennis was beyond the realm of his comprehension. It was along those kind of lines very bad, very dark, um, kind of almost a horrific scenario. He didn't go into much more detail than that. And I, I think it's interesting because we have a couple of guys that live in that area that know that park like the back of their hand. And I can tell you that we have done extensive research and we can't find an area where there's a cave access and a creek running through it because we've made some big efforts to find it. Hmm, man. And, you know, I talk about a lot of paranormal concepts on this show. They come up all the time. And sometimes I wonder if there aren't some strange electromagnetic effects on the planet that we don't understand, similar to how planes fly into the Bermuda Triangle and are covered in this electric fog and are suddenly just disappeared and uh it's it seems like some of these people just do disappear from the scene as if they walked through some type of portal or gateway as weird as that sounds oh i've, I've heard that theory before from probably hundreds of people the issue i have with it is that it is a very very underlying very rare event when more than one person disappears like this 
And you'd think if that was the scenario, we'd be losing more than one person at a time, or there would be witnesses to that other person disappearing. Right. And that, yeah, that is true. Yeah. Well, I mean, another thought I had is we, we cover a ton of conspiracies, you know, alien abductions, Bigfoot and other cryptids, child pedophilia rings of the Vatican and political elite, all sorts of conspiracies and mysteries that insinuate missing people. But a lot of times they don't have names or anyone who's actually gone missing for these things. I wonder if some of these events aren't connected with these types of crimes and these types of things that people talk about happening. So I can only look at it from a, a common sense and a factual viewpoint, and that is is that many of these have occurred pretty deep in the wilderness where there's not a lot going on. And the idea that there's a human abduction process taking place, um, I know a lot of friends that are backpackers that carry guns. And if somebody's going to try it, you know, there's going to be there's going to be some shooting going on, mm -hmm. and you never hear about that. And what I've explained on other shows is whatever is happening here is a hundred percent effective, because <laughs> if they weren't, right. we would hear about a mistake or we would hear about an attempt, and we don't hear about that. Right. Yeah, that's a serious shame. I mean, this should be. One of the most important things, it involves people dying and we don't know why. Isn't that national security? You know, everyone's worried about terrorism globally. Well, here's people going missing right in our own backyard and we don't know what's going on and we don't know who to blame. And I, you would think that they dedicate a little bit of resources to that. Well, you'd hope, but I don't <laughs> think it's going to happen. <laughs> right, right. Well, David, this has been awesome. It's about that time we call it in. It's been a fascinating show. Thanks so much for being here. I mean, several listeners have requested that you come on, and you're the only one doing this, so I, I, I'm very appreciative. But before we go, would you like to tell the people a little bit about your website, where to get the books, and maybe what your plans are for the future with this stuff? So you can go to our web, website. It's canammissing.com, and uh, all four books, Missing 411, as the title of all four books are available on the site. You can also read about cases that are occurring as we speak under current events section at the site. We try to keep it updated with things that uh, are relevant and fit the profile. Uh, I, I don't know if there'll be another book anytime in the near future, but we are looking into some other venues to get this message out. We are going to continue the work. And the only way the work continues is that through the support of people out there in buying the books so it, it's people like you, Greg, that help us get the word out and have read the work and understand that this is a credible issue that needs some attention. So I appreciate that. Oh, absolutely, man. Thank you for that. And I, I, I would recommend them to anyone. I read the third one, and I've heard many cases from the first two. And just hearing now that you've got a fourth one, I'm super excited to dig into that. Uh, it's it's super interesting stuff and far different from a lot of the things that are similar in this realm of fringe topics that I get into. So I, I appreciate it. And the families, I'm sure, appreciate what you're doing, too. But thanks again. You know, keep doing it. Be careful out there, man. You're digging up a lot of stuff that some powerful people seem to want to stay hidden. So make sure you take care of yourself. I appreciate it, Greg, and I'll try. All right, man. Have a good one. Thank you, sir. You got it. There we have it, people. Man, I love, love, love this show. Dave is so good at giving the details of these cases, and it's really an unsolved mystery and something fresh for conspiracy fans, although that sounds a bit morbid. And it was a lot more work than normal to comb through and pull out specific cases that had enough links to present them as not just isolated incidents. So in the first hour, the commonality I latched onto was young kids disappearing and being found many miles away. And Jesus, how creepy is that? And then for the second hour, the main commonality I tried to focus on was people who survived that mentioned strange things about their missing time, meeting dogmen and robots and grandmas clone or hiding from the people. Really weird. 
And if you only heard the first half and you liked it, please consider supporting me and the show with just $5 a month, and I'll support you with a longer episode. I could really use some more signups. It is a pretty crucial point, but thanks to everyone who has. I mean, we're only on the second show of Plus, so to support it this early really does mean a lot. And there were some other cool things that came out of the second hour today, too, like the Bermuda Triangle connection and David's breakdown of the percentage of found alive versus dead or never found. And, you know, I'm really stuck in a bit of a rough place because I want to just give the show to everyone, but I also need to bring in money. And the response has been super understanding and positive. But a few folks have told me they'll never listen again or I've sold out, which is kind of unfair because I think I've done a lot of free work and it is my passion. I don't really mind, but when it is getting in the way of life's necessities, I got to do something. And we're still doing the money bomb on the last show of every month. You know, five shows a month. The last one will be a money bomb winner. So for people to just be like, give me free shit forever or fuck off, that really sours my hope for humanity on a grand scale. Yet some other people are pissed that the first hour is now just a commercial for the second hour. And I don't want it to be like that either. I think these first hours can be appreciated on their own. But I have to inform the people about what's in the second hour. I have to remind listeners that a second hour exists and I'm trying to survive on it and it's available. But we're in transition and I'm kind of smoothing out the edges as we go. But the core of the show, which is great interviews, has and will always remain intact as long as there is weirdness and corruption in the world and people who support my adventure in investigating it. And if you really, I almost regret saying this, but if you really don't think you can afford $5 a month, email me and maybe we can talk. Also, keep sending your music in, people. I've got great plans to create the podcast music archive that helps both the artists and the independent podcasters out there, and I think it's going to be a great fusion. So keep sending me that stuff so I can build it up, go to other podcasters, ask them to do the same for their audience, create a big archive that all these producers have access to, and then independent musicians can start here and there tracks all over the goddamn net it could be really cool but that's it for me this week i've done my part your move wild men of the deep dark redwoods and beyond your fucking move the high 